Okay, today um, the webinar we're going to go over um, some more of the uh, some more advanced topics. Um, we spent uh, we had a couple webinars previous to this, one covering Publisher 3D and one covering Pages 3D, and we went through some of the basics and in the general approach to working with the two products. Um, today we're going to take that a step further um, and dig into some of the data structures built in underneath uh, underneath the uh, overall uh, picture there. Um, we're going to look into uh, configurations. We're going to look into more details on parts lists um, and a bunch of other things there. I don't know on timing. I haven't done a session like this one before, so I don't know on the timing um, how long uh, this one will take. I have, um, let's see, about nine topics. We may have to skip around a few to, to finish it up within the uh, 45 minutes or so because I want to leave some time for questions there. So. Um, hopefully we can hit each topic for about five or six minutes and get a pretty good feel for uh, the topics there. So for some of you that may have missed some of the others, I'm going to do a very quick uh, run through of what the products are and uh, what you can expect to get out of them, and then we'll jump straight into the demo. So, um, Quadraspace has uh, a couple products, and these products are designed to generate uh, lets you author uh, using your 3D uh, CAD files and the metadata that's contained within those uh, to generate printed documents, interactive documents, illustrations, animations, um, all kinds of different outputs that go into sta industry standard formats uh, from a uh, 3D CAD design. Um, the first uh, product, Publisher 3D, takes the 3D information and is used to generate illustrations and animations. Um, so you're really working with just the 3D in uh, Publisher 3D. Um, in Pages 3D, um, you're able to take the 3D, the metadata, images, all kinds of different textual information um, and standard uh, information into the program. And from there, you're able to author complete documents. Um, and Pages 3D supports both interactive and printed documents uh, for uh, your final releases. Um, just a wide range of different applications. People use our software to, uh, to uh, work from, uh, work instructions, technical illustrations, um, just pick out some of the main ones here, online uh, catalogs, uh, data sheets, 3D PDF, a uh, quick and easy way to do that, um, and uh, illustrated parts catalogs is a pretty high-end one. <clears throat> okay, so... From a background perspective there, you should have a reasonable idea. If, if, if you don't, then I would encourage you to take a look or to email me. We don't have these uh, available publicly online, but I do have uh, videos of the publisher and the Pages 3D uh, seminars or webinars from earlier. So just send me an email um, or reply to the follow-up email that you'll get this afternoon and ask for a link to those videos, and I will gladly provide those. Um, but they're not, you're not going to find them just uh, walking around on the website. I'll have to send you the link. So just let me know that you'd like that, and I'll be happy to send that to you. Um, so today, we're going to jump in, and it's going to be a little different. We're not going to, uh, we're going to take each of these topics one at a time and uh, just kind of uh, work with the tool and get a more in-depth understanding of these. <clears throat> we're going to start with configurations, um, and uh, we'll do some parts lists following that, and more of the uh, more details about parts lists. Um, we're going to talk about automatic balloons <clears throat> and how that relates to the parts list as well. Um, we may or may not do the material library. It's going to depend on how I feel about the time at the point there. <clears throat> Let's see. Then we'll uh, do a little bit more on the exploded views. I know you've seen uh, in the previous video some exploded views uh, that we've generated. I'm going to put a little more depth on that, um, bring up the exploded views panel and show you how you can group and uh, work with uh, different objects. And then we're going to do all this in Publisher 3D. In the final part of the Publisher 3D segment, we're just going to use the smart template technology in Publisher 3D and show you a little more depth on how that works. Um, now we're going to use that first section you see there, Publisher 3D. Um, but most of these concepts apply to Pages 3D. In fact, all of them except for uh, even the very last one can apply to Pages 3D. Um, so all of those we can build upon going into Pages 3D. Um, and on the Pages 3D, we'll, we'll close out and bring Pages 3D up at this next point here. And we'll talk about creating a template 
Um, not only just a general, here's a page and here's the way it looks, but we're going to talk about strategies for uh, creating a template that can be used with smart template technology, um, with metadata and those kind of things as part of that. Um, I'm going to briefly go over the project tree and show how all these things that we've uh, built up here uh, can be are pulled together into a working, uh, uh, into a organized uh, section there under the project tree. Then we'll use the smart templates with pages. And finally, um, we'll uh, show some of the techniques for updating your document uh, when your 3D CAD design changes. Okay, so let me go over here to Publisher 3D. Um, everybody should just see that. I'm going to give it a second to <clears throat> switch over. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, we'll just go ahead and grab and import a model here. And we're going to work with configurations initially here. So let's bring in the model um, we've been working with for these sessions here, and it's that power supply uh, unit. And um, what you can see here now is we have a, uh, a model imported. I'm going to go to a just quickly shaded with edges look. And we're going to bring up the model panel so that we can start exploring the structure of this model a little more. Now the model panel here on, uh, was brought up on the model ribbon with the model button here. And what it does is it gives you the tree uh, for the entire uh, master assembly there. So there's our tree. If you notice, we can also flip over to our master parts list where we can search uh, through the metadata or the parts names using the search functionality. Um, if I flip over to the master parts list, we just get the same uh, parts, but they're in a parts list view um, instead of a, uh, a uh, tree view. And here we can go through and click to select. Um, uh, we can right click and do all kind of moving rows around, isolating, uh, hiding parts and manipulating the information. Now, to talk about configurations, we'll go over to our configuration ribbon here. And when you initially load a model, it all comes into a master configuration. And the, when you first start up, this will be every part that's imported in your design. Now, a configuration um, can be used for a couple different reasons. One, the main reason in, in Quadraspace software is to create subsets of parts so that it makes it easier for working uh, with different subsets of your model. Um, one of the uh, easiest ways to create a configuration is if we just go back to assembly tree here. Um, let's say we want to create a configuration from this board assembly. I can select that. In fact, I can right click it and there's a create configuration from sub assembly right there. Um, so once I do that, you'll see that it asked me to name this one. I'll just go with the default name that it chose for me. And when I hit OK, it's now created a configuration for me to work with uh, throughout uh, this uh, project. Now, if I go now to look at the configuration ribbon, you'll see I have a master one. If I click it, I go back to the full scene with all the parts uh, there. If I do a show all, you can see uh, it all is available. If I go to the board, it will now chop down to just these, as if these are the only parts in the model. If I take a look at the assembly tree, you'll see that all of the other parts in the model have this little uh, icon next to them that lets me know that that's not part of this configuration. And if you recall, when we were in the master configuration, these all had uh, the normal icon showing that they were part of it. Now, if you want to further edit this, let's say uh, maybe we actually want to allow the um, base, uh, maybe this I.O. board to be part of this. Um, we can add that back into this configuration. Um, let's see, does that one make sense? Uh, sure. I don't know, uh, you know how logical some of the things I do here is going to make as far as what parts are shown or whatever, but the point is uh, kind of the interface here. So. Uh, let's say we want to add this I.O. board back into this configuration. We can use the Suppress tool. And typically, using the Suppress tool, I would click parts and that would suppress them or remove them from the configuration. In this case, we're going to go to this I.O. board. And if you now notice, when I right click, there's a couple new options. Unsuppress is what we're going to want to use here. 
Um, but these options are only available when the suppress tool is clicked. So we're going to unsuppress that uh, I.O. board. Let's see what happened there. It must have... Board assembly. Huh, somehow that brought back all the things. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and go back and uh, start from here again. Let's do a create configuration from that. And um, looks like there's a little glitch there. That's generally how you would do that. Um, let's see, some other ways of creating configurations. Let's go back to our master uh, slide here or master um, configuration. If we wanted to create, uh, let's say, let's just create one from manual. So if we use our suppress tool, I can go and uh, start from, actually, I want to make a new configuration from all visible parts. And we'll just say my custom one. And then we're going to use the suppress tool to go through and just click on parts to suppress them uh, as desired. So um, let's say we just want to suppress <coughs> the lid and maybe the casing here. Um, so this is just another way to create a configuration. Let's just suppress all of this back here, and we'll have a different configuration that only has this part of the components built into it. So we now have this configuration. It's another way to generate those. Um, another way going back to our master here to create a configuration is to uh, maybe select a few objects. So let's take uh, hold shift and hide here. I'm just going to go through and use control click and select um, our objects and we're just going to make our own configuration from those selected. So we can say create a new configuration from selected parts and we'll just call this a fan config That's the fan, but um, that's the kind of uh, way you would create that configuration. So now, what do you do with configurations? You know how to create them um, and how to modify them. So what would, uh, what would a configuration be used for? Well, the main thing that it's used for, let's go back to our board assembly here, or the second one we created, would be to create a subset of parts. And it's real convenient here. If I go right-click and do a show all, you'll notice it does not bring back all the other parts, it's acting as if this is my only set of parts. And that makes it pretty easy for us to go over to model now, and we can do a new exploded view, and very easily we're only working with this set of parts. So we're not distracted uh, by um, a bunch of other parts um, while we're doing things like exploded views. That's one thing that's, uh, that's pretty strong about the configurations. Another is <clears throat> we have a parts list, and if I look at the master BOM and edit the parts list, you'll notice that this parts list now, while I'm using this configuration, only shows me the items in that configuration. So we have these eight items um, in there, and that means that things like if we go and do a, a new illustration real quick here, um, and if we go and actually add balloons to this using the automatic capabilities, which we'll go over in more detail in just a minute, um, it only adds the components that are in that um, configuration. So and if you can see that if it would have uh, added all the others, it would have made a big mess um, with you know, 50 numbers instead of just this subset of eight that matches our bill of materials, by the way. Let's see. Other topics on configurations. I, I had Project Tree as its own topic, but I think what I'm going to do is kind of show you as we go along, we're going to bring the Project Tree up from time to time um, and talk about that. So you can bring the tree up by right-clicking a panel and hitting Project. And what you'll see here is um, any storyboards that we've created, um, configurations. Here's our configurations that we just uh, generated. Um, they're all listed here, and inside each of these, uh, you'll see that they contain a set of their own parts list, exploded views, and then illustrations <coughs> of that configuration. 
So you'll see every one of them will have a parts list. This is a generated parts list. As soon as you make a configuration, the program will automatically generate a parts list for you. Uh, the one that uh, we create an exploded view, you can see there's now an exploded view here in the parts uh, tree. Um, and there's the three steps we've created for moving these five components. Um, so that's the first step of that. Another oh, last thing I want to show you here is, um, and this I'm just going to mention, I guess this is an advanced, advanced topic. Um, under configurations, you can right click. And you can create a what we call a dependent configuration. By default, every configuration is independent. And you can tell by looking at this tree um, that they're all flat. They're all, let's close these up. They're all in the same level. So the master one, if I make any edits to this, does not affect any of these. Now, if I go and create a dependent configuration, um, let's even do it from the visible parts. Um, we could do it from a sub-assembly if we wanted. Uh, it's going to be the same either way. So let's just do sub-assembly, board assembly. And that created me a new dependent configuration. And you can see now it's listed under this in the tree. Now the difference is this looks like it's the same one as this number one. Um, let's see. I can drag these out to the scene too. So here's number one. This is the one that's that is independent. And if I look at this one, it's going to look the exact same. That's the dependent one. Now, here's what happens. If I go to master, um, and configurations reflect uh, your, uh, not only what parts are suppressed. So if I go to master, and I suppress a couple of these, let's use our suppress tool. Um, and these parts were on both, so I'm going to compress all four of these, let's say. Um, what you're going to see now is if I go to the, um, go back to my project tree, if I go to the dependent one, board assembly, you're going to notice that those are looking back at the master and they're saying, oh, those are suppressed, so I'm not going to show those. But in contrast, if I go to the independent one, you see now this one is not looking at the master uh, the master configuration. So it being independent, it doesn't know or it shouldn't know to uh, suppress those components. So that's a you know a basic overview of the independent versus dependent configurations. Another thing that is captured by the configurations themselves, if I bring up the master here again, if I change a material. Those are captured by the configuration. So if I go to materials, um, let's say I apply a paint. How about a blue paint? And let's apply that to this. Uh, well, this isn't part of it. Um, <coughs> let's apply it to, we're going to apply it to that board. So we'll take our blue paint, apply, and put it on that board. What's going to happen here on the material side is the same thing you saw on the component side. Um, if we bring out the independent one, it's going to go back to our green board. Okay. And if I bring out the dependent one, it's going to have uh, taken that blue color as well. So um, you'll just have to make some decisions there on which kind of configuration you want to use. Again, by default, they're all independent. So you make a new configuration, it's going to have its own set of uh, applied materials. It's going to have its own set of suppressed parts um, and other properties that are captured by the configuration. So that's, I think, going to be uh, a wrap on the configuration topic. It's going to be really tough to get through all these topics uh, rapidly. Um, so we may have to schedule another one of these as a follow-on, but we'll get through what we can here. Um, so let's go back real quick to PowerPoint slideshow here. Uh, parts lists, I'm going to go through and uh, we'll talk about um, what you can do with parts lists, um, the parts list editor. And at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and merge these two topics for the sake of time. Uh, the automatic balloons, because that's just going to be a quick demonstration of how to uh, manipulate the balloons based on a parts list. Okay, so let's go back again.
back into publisher. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's just go back to our master here. And when we bring that up and we go to model, this shows us that we have a master parts list for that uh, model that was generated on import. If I edit this parts list, it brings up the 26 items in here and the quantities. Um, this is the parts list editor. Um, you can find it from the model ribbon, edit parts list. When you're done editing, you hit the done button. But in the interim here, what you will uh, do is you're able to uh, manipulate all this. So if I want to put these cable route on the very top, for example, I can uh, just move that up my tree here. Um, we can also uh, take multiple select if you want to put multiple selects in there. Let's actually move the heat sink to the top. Easier word to remember to look for when we start putting these out. Okay, so the heat sinks on the top. <coughs> um, you can do things like uh, if you have a quantity of greater than one, uh, you can split rows or merge them. So let's say we wanted to merge all of the, uh, these are the little uh, thumb screws at the back of the object. So we could select these two rows. I held down control to select another. And then there's a tool here that merges those. So that would merge those two rows. I must be doing something wrong here. Merge. There you go. And it merged all those. And see, now we have two rows that were had four components each. We now have eight components. And maybe we want to change this to just say thumb screws. So I, let's see if I can type. Um, so we changed that. And um, I double clicked in order to change that field. Um, and this little yellow icon here means that. Uh, this has been modified. It's not looking at metadata anymore. It's actually been typed in custom to this bill of materials or this parts list. Um, okay, so some other functionalities you can do. You may want to delete rows. You just click a row and delete it. Um, you may want to right click and insert a column. Um, when you have metadata that's brought into your uh, from your part metadata, um, then you'll be able to pick from any of the fields that were brought in. Um, in my case, um, I, there's not a lot of metadata on this model, so uh, maybe I'll just go with the material density to add another field as an example. <coughs> and you can modify the bill of materials in that manner, too. Um, now, a really advanced topic that uh, we have write-ups on, and not everybody needs to do this, but... Um, <coughs> There's ways to update and to uh, import metadata from Excel spreadsheets um, instead of using these automatically generated parts lists. So this one would allow you to update a parts list from Excel spreadsheet. It would maintain some of your changes um, and bring in some of the changes from the spreadsheet depending on your choices during that uh, process. So that's kind of how the parts list editor itself works. Um, parts list as a concept. Um, if we go to our project tree here, um, under each configuration, you're going to see one parts list by default. And that one's generated um, as soon as you create the configuration or as soon as you uh, import the model in the case of the master. Now, let's say we wanted to take this one's all the parts. What if we wanted to create a parts list, um, a different parts list, um, top level only potentially? Um, so we just do parts list, and we create a new one. And we're going to do a top-level only one here. Let's start our numbering at 100 for kicks. Uh, let's just do it 10. And then we're going to say top-level only, give it, our, give it a custom name for ourselves to recognize it later. Um, you can also do use visible objects only. wouldn't matter here. All of them are visible. And so when we hit OK, you'll see that it generated a parts list starting at 10, that numbered up to 28. And uh, the biggest difference here was there was a couple of subassemblies. Instead of those subassemblies being broken off into separate parts, it made one line item for each of those subassemblies. So that, de that determines the smaller parts list in, in this case. <coughs> 
So if I hit done, um, I just kind of want to show you how it all organizes here. So now for this configuration, we have a master BOM, the one that was generated automatically, and then top level only, the one we just created. Now, the choice of that is going to determine the numbering uh, of, our, of our ballooning. So if we, uh, for example, um, if we wanted to take this model and add some balloons, we can uh, use the callout tool to pull off a few balloons. That's number 10 in this case, uh, the outside shell. Let's just do a couple so we can recognize them. And 12 pulling off of facing here. That is a reflection of the uh, which bill of materials we've selected. And if you can see here, it's the new one we just created, the top level only one. Now, if I go and if I change this just here, it's not going to make an, an effect. Well, it is. It's asking, would you like to modify the current illustration? And if we say yes, our numbering is going to change. So you can see now we've changed the numbering um, and the, uh, the um, number scheme changed here. This one was 12, I guess, and this one was 10. And this now is a reflection of the master bill of materials, not the uh, top level only uh, bill of materials. So that's how those tie back together. Um, the other thing that is a reference of the uh, bill of materials is your mouse overs. Um, you can see that mouse over here. If I click this, I have a call number, and that's defined by the bill of materials as well. Um, so, and, and I believe any custom fields that you might add to your uh, parts list uh, would be listed here as well, depending on which bill of materials is selected. Okay, let's go back to the project tree again and take a quick look at where all this plays out. So we've been working with the master config only here. And what you see is we have under parts lists, two different parts lists now. Um, another thing some people sometimes run across is they go, they change configurations and then they wonder where their parts list meant. So what went? So let me just kind of describe that. Let's see if we change our configuration to this board assembly. And then we look at our parts list. Uh, look, our, uh, our top level parts list appears to have uh, disappeared. Well, what happened is this actually only shows for exploded views and for parts lists, it only shows the parts lists that are part of that configuration. So now that we're on uh, board assembly, we only have one parts list. So it's properly showing you what's available for that configuration. Uh, exploded views, we made the exploded view for this configuration. So that exploded view exists here. But if I flip back to master, you're going to see that there is no exploded view here because that exploded view is part of the other configuration. And another way to very easily uh, tell that is to look through the tree. You know, um, this, these are the parts lists that are in this configuration. If that configuration is being currently worked on, then you're going to see these on the uh, ribbon items above. So if you ever come to a point and you're like, I know I made a, a parts list or an exploded view or something, um, and you're not seeing it in the menu, uh, what you need to do first is switch to the uh, proper configuration, and then uh, your work will uh, be displayed back for you there. So, And that's a common uh, thing people run across is they uh, are curious about um, what happened to things like that after they've done some work, and uh, that, that would be why. Let's see, i got a question on parts list here, and then I'm going to move on. Um, is it possible to change the default uh, master bill of materials to always include only the top level. Um, the default master one to only include the top level. Let's see. Um, if I go back to master and then I edit it, is it possible to edit the BOM properties? It looks like that it's not. It looks like the master one um, is always going to be a list of all your parts um, in the uh, in the uh, design. That's another uh, difference, um, a thing to note here. That's a good question. Um, there is a difference between the master ones and any of the ones that you would create. Um, the master parts list will always reflect the suppression and unsuppression of that configuration. So if I go through and you see here on my parts list, um, let's see, I don't know what these things are by default. 
how about um, we go and look at this heat sink. Um, if I take the heat sink, and I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe if I go in here and I actually suppress my heat sinks, then they are, end up removed automatically from the master parts list, but not any of the others. Let's see. So if I go back to the master and I hit edit, yeah, our heat sink is gone, um, and we're only on 24 instead of 25. Um, so the master parts list is always a reflection of the actual parts that are in the configuration. Um, and if you want anything different, um, then, uh, then uh, creating a custom one will always be what you create. So it will not, so if I go back to our custom one here, for example, you'll see that the heat sinks, um, oh, they were just part of the board, so it's really not a good example, but um, the heat sinks would uh, have been in the same, um, in the uh, one that we created custom, in our own one, not the master, uh, the suppression state will not change the build materials. It will always say, as you uh, intend. What will happen to updated fields in parts lists after updating the model? Uh, perfect lead into that. Um, in the master one, the parts list will update to uh, reflect changes of metadata um, and to reflect changes of suppression or different parts. Like I said, the master one always reflects the uh, the uh, the current state of that configuration. Now, um, the opposite is true for any of them that you make yourself. If you do an update, um, and we're going to talk more about updates if we have time here today. Uh, if you do an update, then the uh, custom one, the ones that you've generated or imported uh, from other sources, will not change. And that's definitely an intentional thing um, so that people can have you know, A, one that's always reflection of their 3D CAD, but B, the other case is that it's always going to be what you intend it to be. Um, so, and they both have different uses. And again, goes back to, you know, a strategy of how you want to work with those. And if, and I can always help with uh, coming up with that strategy too, if uh, you have questions or some level of confusion there. So I'm going to have to move on here to uh, our next topic. Um, let's go to back to this and take a look at our list. We um, automatic balloons. Uh, we didn't do automatic, but uh, the premise is the same uh, for um, automatic as it was for the way that uh, really what I wanted to show there was the way that the numbering system tied back to the parts list. And um, we did show that with a couple. It's probably easier to understand even by just showing a couple of them change uh, with us selecting a variant of the parts list. Um, skipping material library, um, we can come back and do that another time. Uh, that's a pretty simple one. Um, exploded view tools, let me show those a little bit. I want to give some, some of you guys some depth on those so that you know how to work with that a little better. Um, let's go to <clears throat> here. And we had under, let's go and bring that one exploded view we started up. I think it was here. Under this configuration, yeah, we had Exploded View 1. And we had only moved a few parts, and there they are moved. Let's turn on Trail so we can very easily identify what parts we're working with in here and stuff. Okay. All right, so there's the moves that we made. Um, if you recall, we used the very simple process that um, I demonstrate quite often. Um, you just take and you know click your parts. I'm holding down Control to click to add to this set of parts that's moving and then commonly I use the handle to uh, move the parts up and down. Um, we'll click other one to add it to that list. So that's a real common way of doing that. Um, there's different types of axes that you can use. So let's talk a little bit about editing and making these steps. Um, but the smart axis Basically, it looks at an object and attempts to a to ascertain the pro, the most likely way you're going to want to pull it. And if you see here, it took the cylinder and it said, "You know what? I think you're going to want to pull it that way." And this time, that was right. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we can pull all of those up on the smart axis. 
Um, another one is by object. That's one of the other defaults. It gives a X, Y, Z uh, axis to work from that's always in the coordinates of the uh, model. So um, if I click anything that's offset, there's not really anything here to demonstrate an offset, but clicking these, you can see I grab a just a XYZ axis and pull up on, what is that, red, green? I guess that'd be the Y axis. Um, another axis that you can use is by face. Um, this one's usually used for when something's off center and you want to uh, um, pull it into a strange direction. All these faces are XYZ, so there's not real strong case for benefits here, but, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I guess let's just say one of these is off axis a little bit. You could take and you pick by face, you use the change axis tool, and we click on an object, and that would click the face of that. And then we want to hold down and click that object itself, and we'll pull that off. So it's pulling it off on that face there. Um, a lot of times it would be at a you know 45 degree angle or some 30 degree angle or something, and you're looking for a way to pull it off into a, a strange direction. That would be a good use of face. Smart axis a lot of times will help you there too. Um, and that's uh, back to smart. By point, um, very similar to object, um, usually used for rotations. Um, I'm not going to cover rotations today. Uh, I might do a, a quick one. Let's we'll think about that. Okay, the next thing I really want to show, though, is Exploded View and uh, the uh, what you're actually building when you create an Exploded View. Um, I just click this little extended group icon here, and it brings up our Exploded View panel. And the panel lists, you can see, here's the, um, let's get out of edit mode real quick. Here's the step-by-step -step list of all the moves we just made. Um, if we want to reorder these, we can from here. Let's say that our first step is wrong. It's not that big blue guy. It's Let's say we want to remove the heat sinks first. It's easy. Just move that step up. Now we have that step and then that step. So um, the, the order can be manipulated here. There's also, you may want to group things. Um, when you're doing instruction sets, a lot of the time... A lot of this doesn't really apply. If you're just making an exploded view and you're going to make balloons and callouts, order and grouping is really not something you're going to be concerned with. You're just going to be moving parts and you'll be uh, uh, fine with uh, the end result or the step seven in this case. What does it look like here? Um, if you're making step-by-step -step processes, then you're going to be very concerned with the order of these steps um, and the potential grouping. So let's say, you know, all of these are done, but maybe step, uh, you know, five and let's see, let's go back. Maybe step one and two, maybe the heat sink and the blue guy, uh, this resistor uh, come out at the same time. Um, we can do that by selecting both of these and we're just going to group them um, into a group that will have both of those actions occurring in the same step. Um, so we'll just say animate them simultaneously. You can do them sequentially if you want. Um, so what we look at is we pick our different groups here. You can see that if I pick the group here, it has moved both of those. Um, and this this becomes uh, very important on step by steps and uh, on using smart template technology and those kind of things uh, as we go along here. So. Um, that's one way to group and to work with the, the tree. Another real good of group use of grouping uh, is for animations. Um, uh, rotate it like, uh, for example, a screw that rotates at the same time that it moves. What you would do is create a rotate step and a move step and then group those. And then your animation would show the screw rotating and moving uh, at simultaneously at the same time. So that's how that can be set up. Another thing on the exploded views, and the last topic I want to cover real quick um, is, um, let's go back into editing mode here. Just hit move parts. Uh, if I click these, you can see I have the editing tools back. <coughs> Another way to actually, let's go and do this guy. Another way to actually, uh, instead of just pulling handles and positioning, is to go to, uh, we can right click it, and we can edit the step details. 
And from here, we have a different user interface that allows us to actually type in. So if I wanted to type in a precise unit here, I can type in 0.15 or something. And you can see that that can be used in order to set the placement of the exploded views. Uh, same for selection. Here's it's showing us that just this one guy is going to move in this set. Um, and then there's some timing things here that you can set up for animations. We're not going to talk a lot about animations today, though. Uh, trail type. Um, typically, one trail per subassembly uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, but when you get into the cases where you have a big, uh, you know, a bunch of parts that are just kind of conglomerated, you may want to pick some different ones. One trail per step or um, one trail per part can get pretty messy. It brings, makes a lot of trails potentially. But uh, this is a way to modify the way the trails get drawn. Um, and that would be under uh, the part uh, step properties. You can also get step details by right-clicking the view here when you're in this edit uh, uh, step mode. Okay. All right. So that's a, let's uh, take a quick look again at our project tree. Um, going back to the project tree just to see how that plays out. Okay. If you recall, we were working with this board assembly dash one. Um, it's the one that had the exploded view. None of these other sub assemblies will have it. And here is the uh, step by steps that we created. There's the exploded view. And, um, we can uh, use this just like we did earlier. We can drag and drop to get to just that step or the next step. Um, so we can. Uh, that's one way to manipulate those. Um, here's a here's a key thing about this, the project tree. If you ever are in a state um, you need to delete something from your project, usually, I mean, there's some convenience things built in throughout the program, but you can always come to the tree and uh, delete from here. So if you want to delete this exploded view, you can right click. And there's where your delete capabilities are is under the project tree. Um, if you want to delete an illustration, coming here would be the uh, place to do that. Um, if you want to uh, uh, delete a whole configuration, um, I'd be really careful about deleting configurations because any of the work you did under that are just going to be deleted as well. Um, there is one we could delete right here, though. This one we uh, made and uh, we don't need anymore, so we'll delete that one. And um, so that's kind of thing you can do from here um, in the tree. <coughs> Let's see. I got a question here and see if I can work that. Um, can you turn a, I got a couple questions. Can you turn a field within the parts list or metadata into a hyperlink? Um, there is a couple of ways to do that. Um, most of those is more relevant in the pages product. Um, you can set up in pages where you mouse over a part, um, a field can be used as a hyperlink. So the answer is yes in pages. Um, here, um, I don't know. I think if it had HTTP colon slash slash in front of it, this might be clickable. I'm just not, I'm not sure how it works in the publisher product. It's, we haven't run across much uses there, but in pages, it's definitely something that can be done, um, and it's useful. Let's see. I've got another question. I know that shrink extend moves can be made using X. Is it possible to make bending moves? Um, I believe that, I don't know what you mean by using X, um, but you can, like you said, you can make shrink extend moves by um, using a scale. Uh, step. Bending moves, I don't, um, golly, there may be some way to make them by grouping things in some strange ways, but in general, no, there's not a real good way to create bending moves. Um, like compressing a spring, though, um, that is something that you can do a little bit with uh, shrinking. Um, let's see if I can make that happen. Um, let's make a new exploded view. And um, possibly, let's pretend uh, let's pretend this big guy here is a spring. Um, what you can do is create a scale parts, click that, and let's go to an axis of object, 
and we go, we got our object axis and I want to, uh, actually let's go to point and then we're going to change the axis and put it right down here on the base. There we go. <clears throat> and then scale that guy. Well, right here. We need the axis on the base so that when we do the scale, it'll just compress like that. So you can see that if we had a spring, um, you don't want to get that other axis. Probably the best way to do this is to actually edit the step details and make all of these ones. It looks like Y is the one we're going to want to change. And we can change Y to be 0.1. And then you could create a compression of a spring in a way like that, where you're only compressing one of the axes. Um, <clears throat> now, what will happen is it'll look a little distorted because the uh, spring will also, in that axis, the spring uh, um, coils will also uh, compress, but it is a way to simulate that. So what you would get on the animation side um, would look something like, uh, like this, where this looks a little... I mean, if there's a spring, it looks a little better because the actual coil will compress as well. But um, that's the kind of thing that you can do as, one, as a step and then build around that. Okay, I'm going to have to move on. Um, let's see. Using Smart Templates technology. Um, we have a few things to work with here. Um, what time do we have here? 10.48. I think what we're going to have to do, unfortunately, is draw the line after this part of the session and reschedule for a, this is basically a publisher one. Um, let me show you what I'm looking at. And then we'll come back and do one final one here. I think we're going to have to uh, draw the line page up after smart technology, using smart template technology with publisher 3D and come back and do a pages 3D one. I, uh, um, I don't think we can get through. I want to do a real thorough Pages 3D one with uh, the templates and the uh, smart templates there because I want to make sure everybody understands how to create their own custom templates. It's a real important part of uh, using Pages these days. Uh, so I don't want to rush that. So I think we're going to draw the line after this one, and hopefully you guys can make it back. Uh, we'll probably go for next Tuesday. Um, so let me talk a little bit about smart technology, smart template technology and Publisher. Uh, using the structures that we just made. I want to give some of the tricks and uh, tips on that. So in general, when you saw us use Smart Template Technology before, um, it was very uh, straightforward. Um, you use the storyboard here, and you use a storyboard wizard, and it automatically generates a storyboard for you. So, um, and all you have to do is pick between whether you want to use an exploded view or a parts list as the source. Um, and in general, that's, uh, that's really the uh, case here. Um, just some, we'll go through these things a little uh, uh, slower here, I guess. Um, we're going to create one from one, that exploded view we created. Um, well, not that one, that's just our spring one. We'll go through this one here. And... Um, by uh, doing the reverse steps, we're turning that into a assembly instruction instead of a disassembly instruction. If you remember, uh, one thing that we did different there was we modified the step-by-step uh, -step process, the order of the tree, um, when we were working the, the exploded view. We also created a group, um, and this is where that group will be used. The group here will come out as one step in our visuals here, and that's uh, kind of the point of making the tree with that group uh, for this kind of instruction. Uh, we'll select the parts that are being assembled, so this will select and highlight any parts that are going to move, and hiding, these are real common options here, these top ones, hiding the unassembled parts uh, so that we build up. We'll start with just a blank board. Um, I don't know if we moved all the parts, so uh, we'll start with the parts that aren't going to be assembled to it, and then we'll build on top of that. Um, and then we'll include a view for the assembled state. So once it's done, we want to see what it all, all looks like. Uh, sometimes people end on just the last step, which would be inserting these parts and never show you that, so they wouldn't check this. Um, so we would hit Finish, and um, this brings up and generates a storyboard for us. 
<clears throat> and in the storyboard, we have all these views that we've uh, that that are automatically generated for us. Well, we picked a bad uh, viewpoint to start with. In fact, let's redo that. Let's go here. Um, let's get us a nice, clean, isometric view. Um, before running the smart templates, this is a key step, is to set up um, a good viewpoint. So if we want to get all our views looking like this, um, and to set up the render style. So we take a good, nice, isometric viewpoint. A render style looks fine to me. You may have different preferences. Maybe you want a, a white background or something. So um, you set that up. Maybe you want a highlighting color of red. Um, so you set all this up before running smart template technology. It's the easiest way to do it. And then we're just going to go ahead and run it again. Storyboard, exploded view, and you're going to see the difference between these. We're in the same options. But what we did was we concentrated on setting up our view first. And when we hit finish, it'll go through and uh, generate us a much cleaner graphic here. There you go. That looks like more something we'd want. And all we did was set up our view first so that we had the right viewpoints. And now we have a scene that has our step-by-step -step processes looking the way we want them to look. And you can see that using that exploded view, um, and, and this is a key one here. You can remember we grouped these together. Um, we put the heat sink in with that. And uh, so they come out as one step. And a lot of times, you know, it may be a more complicated uh, procedure than this, but by grouping them, when you make your steps, uh, you can uh, use that because it will make only one graphical scene um, when it goes through and uses the smart templates to, <clears throat> to generate the illustrations. And then since we've checked out one last checkbox, we have an assembled state of, uh, of all the, of everything assembled already here. So, um, do you have any questions uh, on the on the presentation today? I, I sorry we didn't get to the other, but I think it's going to take another thirty minutes or forty five to get through um, to effectively get through the template side of things on pages. Um, <clears throat> I guess one last uh, thing I could show, and I think I should, is updates. I'm looking down the pages list here. Let's do an update in Publisher real quick, and then we'll call it a wrap. Um, when your 3D CAD design changes, let's go back to the more visual uh, model uh, configuration master. Close out this. When uh, when your 3D model changes um, in uh, in SolidWorks or Inventor Pro E or whatever, um, you have you may need to update your documentation. Um, and to do that, you go to Configuration Driven, and there's an Update button here. When you update, any of the changes to the design will be brought into uh, the program at this point, but all the work you did, the exploded views that you've made, uh, those kind of things will remain intact. Um, so to do an update, let's just do one real quick. We have this fan to the left. Um, what you're going to see here... Um, Shoot, let's do something else. Uh, let's make a brand new configuration. I'm only going to do this because I want the heat sinks are one of the things that change, and we had gotten rid of those heat sinks. So what you're going to pay attention to when I do the update here is these heat sinks, we had suppressed them. And this fan's going to move over about an inch. Um, so when we do the update, fan left. And once I hit update, it goes through and it brings in the revised SOLIDWORKS file in this case. And you can see we now have, they've chosen to put different heat sinks into the design. And if you noticed a second ago, this shifted over um, <coughs> to a new uh, spot there. And when we get in there, you can see we have a, a new design uh, built in. And if we go to any of our other uh, scenes, you're going to see like, um, let's go back to our exploded view here where we did this. Um, we need to, uh, that part changed, so we would need to go suppress that. But what I want to point out here is that the heat sinks, 
on the last scene here are the new heat sinks that have the uh, the uh, the different the variant of the heat sink there. So that's how you would do an update. And then the last thing that you'd probably go do in this case is take our board assembly uh, just to make to finalize this update. Since this is a new part, let's go and suppress it. We don't need it in these scenes. And you can see all of you can see all these little working icons here. <coughs> Every one of those scenes is being updated to not have that component in there. So that's one of the slight tweaks you'll need to do is uh, when you update things is to go and kind of strategically do those kind of things. So. All right. Um, well, that's a uh, not all I had planned. But that's all we really have time for today. Um, Again, I'll set up another one, send out emails and everything, and we'll have another one next week, same time, same place. Uh, and we'll go through making templates and working the template side of things on Pages 3D. Um, let's see what else I got here. I think that that's, I mean, we've gone through Publisher. It's for making images and illustrations. <coughs> um, pages is for generating complete documents. And I... You know, I don't think there's much need to go through uh, the rest of the presentation there. If you have any questions that I can answer, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer those right now online or offline. Um, if not, um, hope to see you next week when we uh, talk about Pages 3D. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and I hope uh, you found some of the information here uh, on the more advanced uh, uses uh, helpful, and maybe it'll spawn some other questions. I have a feeling it probably will. All right, thanks a lot, guys.